Hey everyone, Wayne Fox back with part four on this series about color management. So far, we've talked a lot about the way it evolved, kind of the concept behind it. And most of the videos I'm doing in the beginning of this is just so that you are comfortable with the concept and actually will trust a little bit. I find that a lot of photographers, because they really don't understand it, they just don't trust it. Now, bottom line is it's still going to be an act of faith because I don't even know how the black box actually works and how it all works down in the real level. That's way beyond my pay grade. But I do know that if you actually understand a little bit about it and follow up on it and actually set it up right, it actually works really quite well. And of course, the goal here is that when I look at my image on my display, I know that my print is going to look at least very similar to that and usually better. That's if you're doing it right, the print itself will be able to have detail that you won't be able to see on your display. So this video is about a subject that I probably could have done in the next video and included it because it's actually a decision that you're going to have to make when you're getting ready to take your large gamut file that we talked about and then compress that into some output space, whatever that output space might be. But I thought I would make it its own video because it's uh, once you kind of understand this concept, this is really the magic of how color management works. It's how we can take our data and fit it into different devices and do it in such a way that they look quite similar to each other. Now, not exactly the same as color metrically. If we measured them, they're definitely not the same. But anyway, I thought I'd make it a separate video just because I think it's important you understand exactly what's going on once you make that decision. Uh, when you get down to the end, you're going to have to decide what rendering intent you want to tell the color management system to use. And there are four different rendering intents available. But actually, only two of them really apply to photography. But we'll talk about all four. Now, let's talk about exactly what has to happen when we're getting ready to take our data, which is in this large storage space, and all of the pixels that are outside the gamut of the uh, target space, the output space, we have to decide what we're going to do with those. And there are two kind of things that we have to worry about. One is how bright the luminosity values. And we talked about that vertical scale. And in that vertical scale, we talked about how that represents from pure white to pure black. And that's the vertical scale. Now, on, a, on an absolute profile, such as the one you're working in, and all the working space profiles, absolute means absolute. So white is white and black is black. But typically, in an output device, we don't have a pure white white and a pure black black especially if we're going to a printer. The purest white we can get is however white the paper is, and that's not going to be as white as a pure white in the file. Now, maybe your file doesn't have any pure whites, but theoretically, what we're going to have to do is take that limit, and we're going to have to compress it to the whitest white and the blackest black of the paper. Now, there's two things you can do. You can actually just take all the ones that are outside of the limit and just squish them in, but that doesn't result in a very a good looking file you're going to crush your blacks into a block them up and you're going to do the same thing your whites are going to block up so instead what we've got to do is move all of the densities in relation to each other so that we still maintain the tonal relationships between them and that's the first thing that we have to do and the other is just a, the other scale we talked about how the horizontal scale is the saturation and the further we get from the middle the more saturated the color and if we have colors that are outside of that saturation uh, point that's the output space we have to figure out okay what are we going to do when we bring those colors into that space we're going to put them all to the edge or we're going to do something else so let's talk about the four rendering intents and talk about what each one of them does and we're going to show some images on the screen here about how those colors are moving because it's actually kind of interesting and i think the real goal here is it not only help you understand the main difference between the two that photographers use but also to help you kind of understand that, wow, this is actually kind of cool how it takes everything and it tries to maintain a perceptual relationship to the data so that what we see is what we want to see. Okay, so we're going to start with the absolute color metric rendering intent. Basically, it leaves colors that fall inside the destination gamut unchanged and any out of gamut colors are clipped to the edge. No scaling of colors to destination white point is performed. So we're really not going to try to correct anything related to the luminosity values when we use this rendering intent. This intent aims to maintain color accuracy at the expense of preserving relationships between colors. 
So not very useful. Now, I think there are some applications for this, and that's why it's there. But within photography, where we're really working with subtle changes and subtle tonal changes, we don't want to really do that. So let's take a look at a couple of images. I'm going to use this image here, which you might recognize. And as you can see, I've uh, greatly reduced the resolution of this. So I've basically isolated the different colors fairly effectively. And we're also going to take a small section of this and make it even more uh, pixelated. So uh, here we've really narrowed out, we've, you know, we've got the colors that are all represented and yet uh, we don't have a lot of the in-between colors. And this will help us see this better. And here, this is the, this one here is this section of the yellow trees. And so what we have here is a lot of colors that are going to be out of gamut. This particular image, most of the colors are actually going to fall in gamut. So let's go to color think. All right, so these are the colors in the overall image that we just looked at. And what I'm going to do now is turn on the output space I'm going to refer to. And this is the profile for Epson Legacy Beretta paper, one that I've made myself. And if we scale it anywhere that we see color, those are pixels that have to be moved into the space of the paper. And as you can see at the top, we have, uh, if we go to the middle, these are all white points that are going to have to be pushed into the white point. And you probably can't see it down here, but there's probably some black points. Now notice there's quite a bit of a, a space between the maximum white point and the paper white point, and yet we don't see near as much trouble in the black. That's because Legacy Beretta, we can print a really, really dark black. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the... Uh, Profile, I'm going to turn this luminosity down quite a bit. So now we can see all the points that are inside it. And then let's go ahead and uh, set this to vectors so we can see what are going to happen to the colors. Now notice that all the dots in the inside the gray area are not changed at all. And everything else is moved to the edge. So when we talk about this luminosity scale, We've had to move all these down, and yet we didn't move anything proportional. So whatever colors that were here, let's just turn that back to points real quick. So there's already a bunch of colors here, and what we're going to do is we're going to push all of those colors into that as well. Same over here. All these yellows are going to crunch in, and they're going to blend with these yellows. Okay, so that's going to block up the yellows. It's going to block up the whites. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what happens with relative color metric. Relative color metric compares the extreme highlight of the source to that of the destination and shifts all colors accordingly. Out of gamut colors are shifted to the closest reproducible color in the destination space. Relative color metric preserves more of the original colors in an image than perceptual, and we'll get to perceptual here. So if we change this from absolute color metric to relative color metric, you'll see that what happens is now everything's moving. And you'll notice that almost everything is moving to a darker density. That's because we have to move all of these down because they're too bright. And so everything's kind of moving down. When we get to the bottom, they're not moving very far. Let's use a different image and maybe we can see this a little bit better. Okay, we don't have very many dots here, and notice how very few dots are outside gamut. This is the little flowers. There's a few down here that are out of gamut. There's a few, not many. So if we change this to relative color metric, you'll notice we are having to map everything darker. And notice the lower we get to the bottom, the less vertical movement there is. Now these that over here that are moving sort of up, Let's turn that, let's turn that to uh, these that are moving up. It's because they're out of gamut. But notice how very little these move compared to the ones at the top. But not a lot of movement. And most of it you see is in a vertical fashion because it's mostly about the density. Now let's take one more look at one more image. Okay, this is the one where we do have quite a bit out of... Uh, we have quite a bit out, but notice we don't have anything bright, but we have bright yellows. But notice we still, because we have these yellows that are bright, we still have to map the overall tone. 
So basically, relative color metric is focused and its priority is the luminosity values, the relationship of the brightness values. For example, if you're doing a black and white image, almost always relative color metric will be your best option because you don't have any saturated colors and you're wanting to maintain the relationship of the densities along this vertical path. So that's relative color metric, and that's the one that applies to photographers. So that's most of the time, most images will look great. So let's talk about the next rendering 10, and that's saturation. So saturation tries to produce vivid colors in an image at the expense of color accuracy and the other option, which is perceptual. So I've always felt that perceptual and saturation are related and absolute and relative color metric are related. Perceptual aims to preserve the visual relationship between colors so it is perceived as natural to the human eye even though the color values themselves might need to be changed. This intent is suitable for photographic images with lots of out of gamut colors. And that's kind of our first clue of when we might want to use perceptual. Now as I said, I'm more showing this so that you can understand that we're really are manipulating the data. But the idea of these render intents, which is a decision you'll have to make later, is important. And the general rule of thumb is 80% of the time, you won't see a difference. They both will look great or you, the difference is extremely subtle. Another 10% of the time, you might see a difference, but neither is a, both are acceptable, neither objectionable. But some of the time one rendering intent will offer you a better print than another. Now, I've always felt that perceptual is the safest one because that's what we're trying to do is preserve, you know, most of our photography is color. And we're trying to make sure that our saturations, we have nice, smooth gradations. But relative color metric uh, works really well most of the time unless you've got a lot of really, really bright colors and then you might be better off. I have seen occasions where I print a print and it just doesn't look quite right and the other rendering intent offered me a better solution. So let's take a quick look at the difference between perceptual and saturation. We're going to go ahead and turn this image back on and right now we're going to turn on saturation. Hard to see. But what happens here is most of the colors go to the edge and we're trying to keep them bright. If we go to perceptual, you can see there's a lot more movement of the colors. You almost get this feeling that it's curving. Okay, now nothing's curving here. Every line on this is straight. But because these values are going more in and then as they get down, they go lower. So it's kind of weird. Uh, over here, it looks like it's curving, but they're not curving. It's just as you get closer in, the angle changes. Just for curiosity, let's change it to relative color metric. You notice we no longer have that curving look. Most of the images, the data is just kind of going from uh, into gamut and then based, it's being adjusted for luminosity. One more real quick, let's just take a look at this image. And here we've got perceptual okay and now we're going to change it to relative color metric as you can see with relative color metric we're focused more on the luminosity the vertical lines whereas with perceptual we're focused more on the saturation so notice how all these lines here don't move much at all and typically that's what happens the the closer you get to the middle the less they'll move so the whole idea of a rendering intent is to give us a little control on the output come of our compression into an output space. And the only reason I wanted to bring this up now is I'm not going to go into much detail later because this is so you can understand it. But this is kind of the magic of the whole thing. In other words, it's how we convert these colors that we can maintain this similarity between different output devices despite vastly different capabilities. Well, I hope that was at least entertaining and informational. I actually find this stuff is pretty fascinating. Remember, relative color metric is used when the luminosity values and their relationships is the most important part of the image. And perceptual is better off 
when the saturation and the colors are more important. But 80 to 90% of the time, it doesn't matter. And if you're using an outside lab and you're sending them your sRGB file, which usually doesn't, uh, most of the time that's going to use a perceptual rendering intent. It's kind of the safe one, I guess we feel. So in the next video, we're going to talk about the way we set it up. There are two important steps that I don't see many people talking about when they teach this. And those two steps are critical if you want to get really successful at matching your display to your output prints. That's going to take me a few weeks to get done because I'm still kind of getting it set up in my new house. Uh, hopefully I'll get it pretty soon. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and click the bell so when I get that done, you'll be notified and you can watch it. Hey, thanks for watching. See ya.